A penumbral lunar eclipse, the peak of the Eta Aquarid meteor shower, the beginning of noctilucent cloud season, plenty of Milky Way action to be had, and the first opportunity for a sunset Manhattan Henge this year. Welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky for May 2023. And make sure you stick around to the end of the video to find out how you can win a copy of my book, Photographing the Night Sky, as well as other great prizes, all for completely free. Now, following on from last month's solar eclipse, this month we have a lunar eclipse. And lunar eclipses always occur during full moon, which falls on the 5th into the 6th this month. And it's known as the flower moon because it coincides with the blooming of wildflowers in the northern hemisphere. Now, this eclipse will be a penumbral lunar eclipse because the moon will only pass into the penumbral region of Earth's shadow. So Earth's shadow has two regions. There's the dark inner umbral shadow and the not so dark outer penumbral shadow. And during this eclipse, the moon will only pass through the penumbral region of Earth's shadow. Now, normally I'd stand here and tell you that penumbral lunar eclipses are the most boring astronomical event because quite often they're not naked eye visible. But this penumbral lunar eclipse is about as good a penumbral lunar eclipse as you can get because the penumbral magnitude will be 0.96, which means it passes almost completely into the penumbral region and only just misses passing into the umbral region. So there will be a naked eye visible gradient, a darkening gradient across the moon. And like I said, this is about as good as it gets for a penumbral lunar eclipse, and it's the best one we will have until 2042. Now the event is visible almost across the entire populated world, except for North America and South America. So if you're in Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, the Pacific, Indian, Atlantic, or Indian Ocean, or even Antarctica, you will be able to see at least part of the event. Areas that are shaded on this map in the west will be able to see the eclipse during moonrise, and those in shaded regions to the east on this map will experience the eclipse at moonset. Those in the middle regions of this map will be able to enjoy the full four hours and 19 minutes of the eclipse during the middle of the night when the moon is much higher in the sky. I'll put some links in the video description down below so you can find more specific information for your exact location. The following night, May the 6th into the 7th, is the peak of the Eta Aquarid meteor shower. So it's a bit of a shame because the light of the almost full moon is going to wash out probably most of the meteors. It's active from April the 19th to May the 28th, but peaks uh, on the night of the 6th into the 7th, where under dark conditions you can get 50 meteors per hour. But again, the full moon is really going to wash out most of those from view. The radiant point is within the constellation Aquarius, and so it's an event that's visible from both the northern and southern hemispheres. And the radiant point is close to the bright star Eta Aquarii, which gives the meteor shower its name. But the advantage is definitely to those in the southern hemisphere because you have the longer darker nights those in the northern hemisphere from latitudes of sort of 50 degrees north will start to experience the short bright summer nights this month and that continues for the next few months as well however there's one silver lining for those at mid to high latitudes in the northern hemisphere and that's the beginning of noctilucent cloud season they are the highest known clouds to exist forming at an altitude of 85 kilometers up in the mesosphere of earth's atmosphere and during the summer months is actually when the mesosphere is at its coldest and it's cold enough for these ice clouds to form and they're best seen when the sun is between minus 6 and minus 16 degrees below the horizon. So this time of year is perfect. The clouds get illuminated from the underneath by the sun, which is below the horizon. And then observers from latitudes north of sort of 45 degrees will be able to see them glowing against the dark backdrop of twilight. And they really do glow. They're absolutely beautiful and mesmerizing to see. I have an entire video dedicated to explaining what these clouds are, how they form, and how best to photograph them. So I won't dwell much further in this video. You should go and check out this video if it's relevant to you. Now, for those of you that still have dark skies this month, I'm sure you want to know what kind of Milky Way action there is to be had this month. So for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere that still have 
darkness. The Milky Way core will rise into the southeast around midnight and it climbs higher into the south until the morning twilight starts to brighten the skies. And that will vary depending on your latitude. So the closer to the equator you are, the longer and darker your nights are going to be. It's also still a good time to bag a Milky Way arch panorama. So facing east and taking in a 180 degree view, the Milky Way is arching pretty low over the horizon and it's nice and easy to capture in a panorama. If you're in the southern hemisphere, you get a long dark night of Milky Way action. So the Milky Way core will start rising in the east southeast in the late evening and it'll be pretty much fully above the horizon by 9 p.m. And again, for you guys, it's still a good time to get a Milky Way arch panorama, but for you, you'll be facing more south, taking in a 180 degree field of view, and the Milky Way is arching nice and low across the horizon, so perfect time for a panorama. You'll have the Crux constellation and Carina Nebula at the apex of the arch, and also the Gum Nebula and Vela constellation in the southwest, with the large and small Magellanic clouds underneath the arch. As the night goes on, the Milky Way core will climb higher and higher into the east until it passes overhead, and this is a really good time to pull out a star tracker, a long telephoto lens, and get some amazing detail on the Milky way core. As for the planets this month, we actually have an opportunity to see all five of the naked eye visible planets. As darkness falls, you'll find Venus and Mars in the west. Mars, the higher of the two, starts the month in Gemini and moves into Cancer, shining at a modest magnitude 1.5. Venus is much brighter, reaching magnitude minus 4.4 this month, and it starts the month in Taurus but climbs higher into Gemini by the end of the month. It's joined by a crescent moon on May the 23rd, and then a day later, an even thicker crescent moon joins Mars higher in the sky. Saturn is in Aquarius this month, shining at a magnitude plus 1. It rises after midnight during the pre-dawn hours. Then by the end of the month, both Jupiter and Mercury will return to the morning skies in the east. With Mercury reaching greatest western elongation, its furthest distance from the sun on the 29th. However, it'll be very difficult to spot these two from the northern hemisphere due to two things. One is that the nights are very short and bright. And the second thing is that the ecliptic is at a very shallow angle to the horizon. So they don't get very high above the horizon. So you really need a clear view of the horizon to spot them. They'll be much easier to see from the southern hemisphere where the nights are much longer and darker and also the ecliptic is angled much steeper against the horizon so they get much higher above the horizon before the morning twilight starts to fade away the stars and the planets. They will be joined by a very thin crescent moon on the 17th and also on the 18th. A great opportunity if you do have a clear view of the horizon and this gathering. Last but not least, an event that doesn't occur in the night sky, but I thought it'd be worth a mention here as so many photographers watch these videos, and that is the first sunset opportunity for Manhattan Henge. The term is claimed to have been coined by astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson with an analogy to Stonehenge, albeit a far more urban and accidental solar observatory compared to Stonehenge. There's one of four opportunities of the year, with two of them being sunsets and two being sunrises, and the dates change slightly every year. So this year it's expected to be May the 30th for the perfect alignment, but a couple of days before and after you still have a very similar opportunity to get that photograph. So for those of you in the heavily light polluted New York City, an interesting astronomical photographic opportunity. And that's all I've got for you this month, guys. Now onto the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target, subject, or theme for people to photograph, upload your images to social media using the hashtag Wittens, and I pick my favorite three each month for a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Lightroom presets, second place wins a Constellation hoodie, and first place was a copy of my book, Photographing the Night Sky. Last month's challenge was moon and planets, so images with the moon and planets together, and we had a lot of entries for the moon and Venus conjunction. So in third place was vagamo.it, with this image of a person holding Venus in their hand with the moon in the sky. And I just love that moonlight on the foreground, bringing out the textures and the shadow of the person as well. In second place was Ricarda with this amazing image of the Aurora Borealis from Lithuania. Just a sky full of aurora, but then you have the moon and Venus in the center of the frame. Absolutely beautiful image and some amazing displays of Aurora Borealis this month. And in first place was Craig Hiltz with this beautiful simplistic image of a house or a hut. And I just love 
that twilight gradient. I love the symmetry of this image, the simplicity, the delicacy of that crescent moon with the earth shine and Venus shining brightly above. This month there are some good opportunities for Milky Way panoramas, so before the summer twilight takes over the northern hemisphere, let's go with Milky Way panoramas, and I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Thanks for watching another episode of What's in the Night Sky. Hit subscribe if you haven't already, and if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.